Welcome everyone. My name is Beth Jenkins. I am the service leader for today's service. We have been sharing services on Zoom since March 22nd and have been conducting lay services since the end of January when our Minister Brian Kiley retired. Most of you know this, but I'm saying this in case we have visitors that are joining us for the first time. Everyone is welcome here. And we'll start with the little bells. We're a welcoming congregation. This means our community is open to all without regard to race, gender, sexual orientation, age, or income. You are welcome here. The Unitarian Church of Edmonton gathers with gratitude on Treaty 6 land. A treaty is an inheritance, a responsibility, and a relationship. May we be good neighbors to one another, good stewards to our planet, and good ancestors for all of our children. We will start the service with a prelude. This music was written by Gordon Ritchie, who is co-director of Coriolis, our choir. The vocals are sung by Gordon Ritchie, and the words he is singing were created by Robbie Burns. If flowery banks, O oh bunny do, how can ye bloom so fair? How can ye chant, ye little birds? And I say, for Now break my heart, thou bunny bird That sings upon the bough Now mind me, O oh, the happy days When my false love was true Now break my heart, thou bunny bird that sings beside thy mate For say I sat and say I sang And wist now oh, my fate
Our chalice reading is by Jennifer McLaughlin. As the first hint of green begins to peek through the barren ground, as that little sprig grows into a healthy stem, as that stem grows into a stalk and forms a bud, as the bud slowly opens with each new day to form a yellow daffodil, let us be like that first hint of green, renewed by the warmth of the sun's rays and ready to emerge with a new energy, ready to face the day. We light this chalice to bring a glimmer of that warmth into our space. The flower communion, sometimes referred to as the flower ceremony or flower festival, is an annual ritual that celebrates beauty, human uniqueness, diversity, and community. Originally created in 1923 by Unitarian minister Norbert Chopik of Prague, Czechoslovakia, the flower ceremony was introduced to the United States by Reverend Maya Chapik, Norbert's widow. In this ceremony, everyone in the congregation brings a flower. Each person places a flower on the altar or in a shared vase. The congregation and minister bless the flowers and they're redistributed, and each person brings home a different flower than the one that they brought. My preference is to call this ceremony a flower communion, particularly this year as we're coming together in ways that we had never imagined we could do even two or three months ago. And if you didn't have an opportunity to bring a physical flower into your space along with you, I invite you to, as the slides show flowers and images, or you can wander back to the banks of Bonnie Dune and pick some wildflowers as long as you pick them gently and don't uproot them. We can use our imaginations to make sure that each of us has a flower. And at the end, when we are able to take away a flower, there'll be a reflection that lets us think of which one we will want to take. The Unitarian Church of Edmonton is a self-governing and self-supporting community. We rely on donations to support staff and our programs. During this unprecedented time, we need your financial support more than ever to maintain the connections with members and friends. And we can make our donations. Some of us have already set up ongoing um, monthly donations with uh, electronic transfer. Others who would normally put uh, cash donation into the collection plate or write a check monthly, may go to the Unitarian Church of Edmonton website and click on the link to Canada Helps and you can donate online or you can mail the check to the church and we'll be picking up the mail on a regular basis. Each month when we are together, the un unidentified cash contributions are split evenly between the church and the community group of the month. This month, for the month of June, the community group that we are sharing with is the George Spady Center. The George Spady Center in Edmonton is recognized as a leader in the development and delivery of effective services for the care, treatment, and support of individuals with substance-related disorders and dual diagnoses. People who come to the George Spady Center find dignity, hope, and healing as they set a new path towards health and well-being. And you can go to the George Spady Center's website. The website URL is on the screen, https colon forward slash forward slash triple w dot gspady dot org forward slash. It's also in the order of service emailing 
that uh, went out to everybody. And it should be in the church newsletter. So there are multiple ways of sharing our abundance with the George Spady Center. In the meantime, we can think of the collection plates passing around and you can put your virtual flower into the virtual basket and they'll be gathered at the center. And in the, I will now move us to... We sing from you, I receive. Travelers Upon the Earth by Elizabeth Strong. Enter into the communion of flowers with joyful hearts. Enter with reverent thoughts. It has taken long months beneath cold ground for these flowers to prepare their blooming. It has taken each of us long times of growth through sorrow and joy to prepare for our living now. The blooming season is short. The flowers stay only a brief time. We are travelers upon the earth, travelers through all to brief lifetimes. Therefore, let our moments be bountiful. Let us rejoice in our unique colors, aromas, and sounds. Let us celebrate together in love that as we travel away, we take with us the memory of golden hours together among the flowers. And we'll now have time for candles of care and connection. There are many events going on in the world that cause us sorrow, that cause us joy. I invite you to use the chat feature to enter your candle. And if you prefer, you can also email it to candles at uce.ca. <laughs>
So this reading by Reverend Gary Kowalski, when I think of power, strength, sheer physical force, I think of an avalanche. Tons of thundering snow come falling down the side of a steep mountain with the speed and irresistible force of a locomotive or freight train. In an instant, an avalanche can sweep away everything in its path. But there's something even more powerful than an avalanche, and that's a glacier. A glacier doesn't move as fast as an avalanche. It can be slow, inching forward a few yards in the course of an entire year. But glaciers are enormous. They can be a mile wide and hundreds of feet thick. This is American writing. But glaciers are enormous, yes. They can be a mile wide and hundreds of feet thick, a creeping river of ice that can move boulders like matchsticks and grind smaller rocks to powder, fine as flour. Avalanches and glaciers are powerful forces of nature, very strong, giants of the natural world. But there's something even stronger in nature, and that would be a flower. I'm thinking of the avalanche lily and the glacier lily. Each spring, as the snow begins to melt in the high mountains, these tiny flowers push their slender green stalks upward through the softening ice, through the wintry crust, and into the warming sun. The avalanche lily has white flowers with a yellow center, and the glacier lily is all yellow. Neither is very big. They are, in fact, barely six inches high, and as the bloom opens, the stem droops over so they look even shorter. I have actually seen the glacier lily twice. Once at Pato Lake along the Banff Jasper Highway and on that same journey later into the vacation trip at the base of the glacier that sits at the very top of the Going to the Sun Road in Montana. Lovely, lovely little flowers. So compared to a glacier, they're tiny. The flowers just an inch or two in size, but the bud is inside a growing green stem that pierces right through the cold overlay of February and March and brightens into the promise of April and a brand new season. It was June when I saw them, but we are further north. Flowers themselves are newcomers on the earth. For in the beginning, millions of years ago, there were no flowers. There were ferns, there were fungi, there were dull, mossy-colored plants that spread and reproduced by spores. But there were no orchids or azaleas, no blossoms of apple or peach or pear, no fields of grass or daisies or brightly colored wildflowers. It was a monotonous world, not only dull in color, but also dull in sense and feeling. For this was the age of dinosaurs, great hulking lizards who ruled the earth through brute force. They were giants of the animal kingdom, big and powerful, but dumb in the sense that they didn't speak, like an avalanche or a glacier. They were no match for flowers, you understand. For toward the end of the age of dinosaurs, about a hundred million years ago, something strange and very wonderful happened. Plants learned how to do a new thing. They learned how to reproduce through seeds. Unlike the spores that preceded them, Seeds were actually tiny organisms, embryonic but ready to grow, packaged like meals to go with a built-in store of nutrition. And that gave the world an entirely new source of edible and abundant energy. Energy that could be converted into heat, that boosted the temperature of the four-legged and flying creatures up a notch from cold-blooded to warm. Birds and mammals appeared, the limbic system that governs the emotions was laid over the old reptilian brain and the inner landscape changed. Mothers began to feel a deepened bond with their children and children clung with affection to the parents. Love appeared and loyalty and grief, tears and laughter, curiosity and play. All made possible by the blooming plants that had turned the earth 
into a botanical buffet of rare fragrances and sweet perfumes. So the invention of seeds came, with the invention of seeds came all of the birds, the cardinals, and the grosbeaks and finches, and the grass made grasslands, and all the creatures that thrive on the grassland, horses and zebras, prairie dogs and antelope and deer. And plants learned how to produce fruit and the fruit also made meals for monkeys and chimpanzees and finally for you and me. And it all started with the rise of the angiosperms. Oh. oh it's not. There we are. It all started with the rise of the angiosperms, which is the name scientists gave to the flowers or plants that produce seeds and flowers and fruits. The earth took on a whole new look. The ferns were crowded out by all the amazing diversity of life we see today, and the slow moving dinosaurs gave way, replaced by creatures that were not only quick, but also quick witted, warm blooded and warm hearted sensitive and tender, as bright and agile mentally as the flowers were brilliant in all their purples and yellows and blues and crimsons. No wonder flowers are the symbol of springtime and hope. For there have always been empires that established their rule through sheer raw power, kingdoms of this world based on military domination of their neighbors. The Roman Empire was like that. It's legions like glaciers that slowly crushed everyone who stood in their way. Their rulers were tyrant kings like Tyrannosaurus, but they were no match for the power of one small man, no match for the purity and simplicity of his vision. Jesus spoke of the lilies of the field because he himself was like a flower. And as Andrew Mills pointed out in his service a week ago, Jesus didn't need to be divine to be a uh, an excellent teacher and preacher. His stories still stay with us. Almost effortlessly, the beauty of his words and deeds captured the hearts of people who listened and became his disciples. He said his kingdom like, was like a seed that could spread and grow. And as we nurtured that seed of compassion inside ourselves, it would become the greatest force on earth. It was the simple truth. For there have always been regimes like the Romans. The Nazis were similar, their stormtroopers icy cold and unyielding, their panzer divisions like lumbering giants clattering with fearsome armor into combat. They were ruled over by a despot, predatory and bloodthirsty as any Caesar or thunder lizard. But again, they were no match for the flowers or the man who shared them. Norbert Chopik was a Unitarian minister who lived in the last century in the city of Prague. His home and his church were overrun by German soldiers in the years of World War II. He gave his life defying their cruel occupation, but before he died, he influenced thousands of people with the beauty of his words, the beauty of his ideals, including the flower communion that he originated, symbolizing the light and color and fragrance of many creeds, many cultures, and many races joining together in a bright living bouquet. The Nazis are now gone, but the flower communion continues to be celebrated in Kowalski's congregation, in our own congregation, and in Unitarian congregations throughout North America. The flower communion is a testament to the power of love to withstand hate and to the vision of a tolerant faith which sweeps the world, not by persecution or threats of violence, but by drawing people to its principles like the sweet scent of peace and freedom. So the flowers we share this morning bring us the assurance that warmth and kindness can pierce through the frost of cruelty and indifference, that mercy and decency will blossom that goodness has deep roots and will prevail. What seems most fragile and perishable is most persistent and enduring. Sisterhood and brotherhood, justice and charity will ultimately prevail. This is the lesson of the lilies. 
And now I invite Audrey to unmute and share with us the blessing of the flowers. Over to you, Audrey. Okay. <clears throat> the meditation uh, blessing is by Lisa Daigie, and it's called No Hothouse Flowers. No hothouse flowers, these, red for per perfection, dyed and trimmed, and arranged to order, clothed in ribbons and bows. Not these. No, these are hardy, raw, and wild, grown under the sky. They've weathered the wind and the rain and the heat. These drew nutrients from the neighborhood soil and energy from the sun. These survived pests and disease. These grow where they're planted by loving hands or the whim of birds or the caprice of the breeze. These have petals washed by dew, glowing with the colors of the hills, the sea, the prairies, or the or the rocks. Their delicate perfume carries in it the fragrance of earth. No, not perfect these, only holy, a blessing to the eye, the heart, and soul. Blessed be. Thank you, Audrey. from the Navajo of North America. Beauty is before me and beauty is behind me. Above me and below me hovers the beautiful. I am surrounded by it. I am immersed in it. In my youth, I am aware of it. And in old age, I shall walk quietly the beautiful trail. In beauty, it is begun. In beauty, it is ended. Our chalice is going to be extinguished, but its light lives on in the hearts and the minds of each one of us. Carry it with you when you leave this place and share it 
with those you know, those you love, and those you are yet to meet. We'll sing Carry the Flame of Peace and Love until we meet again. And you can form a chalice by placing your arms above your head. Give yourself a self-hug or reach out to give a virtual hug to whomever needs one. And now, a few announcements and reminders. Tuesday evenings, there's a coffee hour that runs from 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. And just like normal coffee time, you can drop in for a few minutes or stay right to the end. It's a good opportunity to just check in with people and a good opportunity to do some practicing of some of the Zoom tasks if anybody wants to get comfortable with that before we uh, try things out on a Sunday. Wednesdays, Reverend Ann's Coffee Chat takes place from 10 to 11.30 a.m., a dollar welcome. On Saturdays, Ilara, with the Westwood Congregation, Director of Religious Education, will be hosting a weekly time for families on Saturdays at 3 p.m., and there will be story time with Spruce at that time. There's Zoom practice with Vancouver Unitarians every Thursday at 3 p.m., which uh, as people are working from home, you may have some flexibility and be able to join in on that and see the check-in where people are and go from there. Coming up next week, the youth group will be leading the service on being queer but not sexual. That is the pride service theme this year. On the 21st, the summer solstice, we'll think about our sacred relationship with the earth and all other living things. Allie Hammington and Reverend Amy Beltane will be uh, leading that service. And on June the 28th, another way of appreciating the natural world will be the blessing of the pets or the blessing of the animals. That'll be a joint service with Westwood and UCE. And you can email photos of your animal companion, your furry little buddy, to worship at westwoodunitarian.ca. And that information is also in the UCE newsletter. <laughs> 